Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the first of four webinars from the Briefing Trader team. I'm Mike Midland. I run sales for the Trader product and I'll be hosting the webinar today. The topic today is tech stocks with the greatest upside. And we have tech expert Sean Udall, who goes by Tech T on our site and the newest addition to the Briefing Trader team with us. Before I toss it to Sean, I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of Trader to highlight the Briefing Trader specific content and where to find Sean's work on the site. Then Sean will divulge his top tech picks, and we're going to wrap up with, wrap up with a Q&A session. So if you guys want to ask a question, just use the chat feature on the bottom left. We'll try to get to most questions, and Sean will follow up with an emailed response, or we'll post the answers live on the site to those we can't get to. Okay, so now let's head over to Briefing Trader. I'll quickly run through the basics of the Trader service. Okay, right now we're on our dual and play page. So this is the default landing page for Trader. As you can see, it's a split screen with live market coverage on the left. And as I click through the filter here, you can see this is fully uh, customizable. So you get broker research, M&A news, IPOs, rumors, and so forth. On the right-hand side, we have, we have the proprietary trading calls to all our different senior traders. Each one of these 10 senior traders will be making live day and swing trading calls with entry and exit points and providing daily macro color, technical analysis, and basically anything that's key to the market on any given day. I'm going to click on this custom ticker tab here. So each one of the traders has their own custom ticker. And you, as you can see here, Sean's is Tech T. So his trading investing focuses on technology, but he's also involved in the biotechs, energy, and financials and uses fundamental and technical analysis. This basically just gives a quick one sentence description of each trader. So I'm going to close this out and I'll show you where to find Sean's work on the site. So you can do one of two things here. If you're searching for any of the specific traders, you just go up to the search window here and I'll type in tech T, T C H T, hit enter. Now we can see and look at all Sean's content from the last two days. You can see here he's got a comment on PayPal, which he picked up recently, starting to move up. He's looking forward to go to the 50, 55 area, if not higher. Here's a note on Twilio's earnings from last night. In addition to doing searches on any of the traders to find their contents, you can also go up to this Portfolios and Emails tab. And if you click Manage Portfolios and Emails, it allows you to set up and enter all the trader tickers. What this will do will give you live trading alerts, whenever they make any trading calls, as well as any analysis or commentary. And you can also alert you, to, you should, excuse me, you can also get a portfolio summary, which will summarize all the trading calls by any trader you put in your portfolio. Okay, so there's also a slew of research that comes with the trader service. You can access all this under investing and trading. So I scroll down here, I'm gonna click on emerging growth stocks. And this is basically a proprietary list of small to mid cap companies that show accelerating sales and earnings growth combined with relative strength. We also have an IPO section, which we call the next big thing. This section will detail the business and financial metrics as well as grades every IPO from A to D based on their pricing and valuation. And this is obviously expected to be a huge year for IPOs with Snapchat, Airbnb, Uber, and Spotify on tap, just to name a few. As far as technical research, if you click on TA page scans, this will open a variety of different scans that have been developed over the years by our chief market technician, Scott Smith. He trades under BlueX. So this list basically does your homework for you, and he'll place a large percentage of his trades directly from this list. We also have TA page setups, and these are basically some hand-picked charts that are coming to longer-term support. You can see here Hess is highlighted. All these articles will be highlighted to the right, too. If you see any ticker you've traded before you're interested in, you can go ahead and click on any of these and pull it up. As far as uh, fundamental coverage, we have ETF analysis, and we break it down into two separate areas. ETF daily notes provides macro color and a daily view of the market. 
It also shows what indices and sectors you should be focusing, focusing on, and basically where the best opportunities are each day. You can see here the uh, oil is highlighted as well as copper today. We also have an intermediate term macro picture of the market, which you can access under industry insight. So I'm going to open up this. So, and this basically will give you a detailed monthly macro outlook in the market and it's put out by our chart trader. And it'll give you an in-depth intermediate view of the market. So as you can see last year, he's commenting on a couple of his big trades. He was short the S&P futures for 250 points in late December and called the bottom in the oil by getting short the DWTI for 350 points as well as long the gold miners when he shorted dust from 17 to four. So this will be under industry insight. So if you guys have any questions about any of the content on the site, I'm available to answer any questions and also demo the service as well. My email is mmidland, that's M-M-I-D-L-A-N-D-1, excuse me, mmidland at briefing.com. Okay, now I'm going to toss it to Sean, and we'll get into his background and get some tech picks. Hey, everybody, how you doing? Um, so so on my uh, on my background, I think we'll get to that page here in a second, what, what really got me going uh, I worked for Visa and I worked for Verifone. Um, this is a this was before Verifone's first first buyout by Hewlett Packard, and um, you know I worked in a finance area. I was basically a senior treasury analyst, um, doing a lot of foreign currency work and hedging work and and bond deals and things like that. But what you know, the Visa's headquartered in Foster City, California, as was Verifone. And just being in and around those companies and pretty much every company I've worked for, I've been selected to be on the, the merger and acquisition team as well. So, uh, you know, I don't know, just uh, basically being in the Valley, living down there, working at Visa gave me, uh, and Verifone pretty much got me into researching technology companies. Then from there, I quickly went to, um, I quickly went to uh, Morgan Stanley, did about eight, nine year stint there. I was basically a discretionary money manager inside of, uh, of, their, of their arm. Uh, and, and then I ended up, uh, I don't know, it was around 2005, 06, basically going out on my own uh, and, and doing stints in, as an independent trader. I did, I did do one more formal job <clears throat> with a very, very large U.S. financial company. Uh, and I was basically one of their uh, head risk managers for financial risk. Um, but I think that's enough about me. I mean, if you guys did a Google search on me, I've been writing, I've also been writing investment commentary, mostly on tech stocks, probably since 07, 08. So if you had to do a Google Google search on me and look for, you know, investment commentary, uh, there, you know, a whole a whole bunch of stuff will come up. Anyway, next slide, please. Um, so what we're going to talk about today uh, you know, it's funny. The, the titles of slides or, or presentations are all funny. I, I, I think a better title, but it would be longer winded, would be uh, a small snapshot snapshot of a bunch of a bunch of setups I like right now. In fact, it's, it's always hard to define a list as a very small number of names, especially given the environment we're in right now. But I think just real quickly, I think I think uh, I, I do. Uh, it's it's always easy to favor the sector that you primarily cover, so you always have to be a little careful about sort of having a bias to the sector that you just spend the most time researching. But I do think the setup for tech is very good right now. And there's certainly been times where I haven't said that. Early 2014, I basically said the whole cloud group and most of technology, especially anything that was a hot growth company, was, was, was in a, a minor to a, a major bubble. And that turned out to be a pretty good call and being negative on tech for a good half a year or more. Uh, so there's certainly been times I, I haven't liked tech. I've been, I've been a huge Apple booster for many years. And then, you know, mid-2012, I basically hated Apple and made Google my largest position and, and went to a zero position in Apple. So there's been plenty of times in history where I, where I, I kind of see where uh, I can see the setup isn't, isn't as good, too. Um, you know, oil oil has been dropping a bit here. I do like some of the oil names right now. Um, so it's one of these things where uh, kind of if, if the negativity were, were, were to really start ramping up in the oil space again, uh, I'd probably get more bullish on the group, and then the financials. I, you know, this, I mean, it's the most obvious trade in the world, um, but but it's it's uh, it, I think it's a little overextended short term. I, I do think there's a pullback coming, but it's it's hard to say that the setup for financials isn't the best it's been 
oh gosh, in, in you know, maybe a decade or more. The other thing, I'm going to hit home on this point a few times. Um, I, th- here, here's the whole thing with, with uh, financials are the biggest buyers of technology. And I think it's very easy to forget about that because financials, and this is meaning the biggest banks, biggest brokerage firms, biggest insurance companies, uh, they've been in basically a no investment, kind of a, what I would almost call an emergency investment cycle for a long time meaning they haven't really bought any IT infrastructure um, and haven't spent any money on that for roughly a decade. So so all of a sudden, if the companies are doing better, if their fund- fundamentals are improving, and especially if their stock prices are higher, I think, I think what's very underestimated right now in the technology sector is how much spending the financials could do. So, so that all kind of wraps up into a thesis that currently I think there's a pretty good setup given the revenue and earnings growth relative to valuations of a lot of tech stocks look pretty good right now. Um, I, I put in here the parallels to a 2013 setup, and, and the best parallel I can think of is that going into 2013, um, no, nobody really expected that the market would have a great year. It's easy to look back now and say, oh, 2013 was the Whopper year. Uh, but going into that year, uh, it wasn't it wasn't supposed to be. Uh, there were worries about the Fed, um, but the biggest issue was in 2012. Uh, the market was sort of uh, the in fact the acronym was all about Apple. So it was a very thin market. There were very few winners, uh, and then Apple started coming down hard late 2012 and early 13. And sort of the pundit opinion was that oh my gosh, if we lose Apple, the Nasdaq's going to crash. Well, what actually happened is Apple went down. It sort of allowed that market cap to be sucked up by hundreds and hundreds of names. So what's the difference between now and then? Obviously, last year, really the last 18 months, hasn't been all about Apple, but it's been all about Fang. And Fang, obviously, is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. But the same thing, we've had, we've had 12 to 18 months or longer. We've had incredibly narrow leadership. And we've, we've effectively had eight stocks take the market to highs. And we've had, you know, 400 or 500 or 1,000 other stocks have been ignored. Um, so you always have to look at the other side. Uh, but anyway, the, getting back to that, though, I think the, the parallel is uncanny. I, mean, I think nobody's expecting we could have a good market. So far, it's surprising. It's, it's turning out to be a pretty good market. Um, anyway, bottom line, you always have to look at the other side. Uh, the macro environment, I think, is improving. I think global growth is probably going to surprise to the upside. But so far, I've been look, kind of looking for a rotation trade, a trade away from FANG into literally 50 or 100 or 200 companies. I, I don't know, for probably the better part of at least a quarter, if not two quarters. It's starting to kind of show, but we really haven't seen a major rotation trade to value um, this, I mean, even today, the, the, the FANG contingent is very strong today. The market's really flat and boring. So as long as FANG is leading, um, we, we kind of need that flip. We kind of need that switch. But the bottom line, we haven't had uh, very much pin action um, uh, aside from kind of the favorite names. Um, so, Mike, next slide, please. So anyway, we'll, we'll get to the next slide here here in a minute. Um, uh, going forward, uh, we're, we're going to have uh, uh, kind of get to some certain topics. I'm going to really hone in on why I think the cybersecurity cycle uh, could be one of the best subsectors of tech. Uh, I'm going to have quite a few charts. I'm going to rifle them through through pretty darn quickly, uh, and I'll kind of have some of my favorite longs and favorite shorts right now. Uh, the M and A, you know, tech M and A really started heating up a little bit last year, but it's still really, really. I mean, it's. Uh, I think the best way to call it would be muted. And and again, we don't have pin action. You get a deal, for example, a very, very interesting deal that just happened with Cisco buying App Dynamics. That was a private company, but that's basically a buy into the big data thesis and in artificial intelligence. And what's sort of a stunning now, New Relic had a, had, had a big move when they reported last night, had a good report. Um, but we really didn't see much, again, we didn't really see much pin action, but that's, a, that's an area that, that I'll talk more to. Um, so we could go ahead and just go the, to, to the next slide because I'm going to pretty much cover all these points uh, over the next few slides. So as far as the macro economy, I always think you have to look at tech especially, you know, financials, any sector you cover with the macro view. So, so I think the, the bottom line is 
the, 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 what's been the big fear? The big fear is that rising rates are, are, are going to hurt economic growth. They're going to you know, make the dollar really strong. They're going to hurt tech. Uh, I would actually point to, again, what, what happened in 2013. Rates actually rose quite a bit, and stocks did really, really well. Um, and the dollar didn't really surge. Uh, so, so I actually think the Fed has room. Now, if they raise 200, 250 basis points, that's going to be too much. Um, but I think they can raise kind of up to that point. Uh, ideally, they raise about another 100. And if they're done, it's still an incredibly accommodative environment. As far as the 2013 thesis, I pretty much already explained it. Um, but I think as long as the Fed doesn't go crazy and as long as we don't have a big Fed overshoot, let's say they take rates more than 200 to 250 basis points higher than they are right now, I, I, you know, I think the macro environment is probably a little better than people think. So, again, I'd like higher rates. I don't think it necessarily hurts the dollar. I think higher rates actually stimulate a lot of other um, – so the bottom line – you know, it's uh, it, it's uh, I think it's a better environment than than what a lot of people think. Um, and and I've already addressed who the big who who are the biggest buyers of tech, the biggest buyers of tech. And again, this is technology capital spending, uh, technology capital spending by by far and away uh, is is dominated by financial companies. So next slide, please. All right, so let, let's talk specifically about uh, about technology M and A. Right? Again, last year we saw it heating up a little bit, but in, and I've been talking about this probably for a year or two, if not longer. But there's there's anywhere from one and a half to two trillion in in market cap. Now this is this is the market caps of the names I have here, the market caps of you know IBM, Cisco, Apple, Intel, and you know there's probably another ten names that that we could add to that list. But you you have this huge subset of very large cap companies, some of which by the way the stocks have done marvelously. Microsoft's a great example of a stock that's uh, that's been very very strong. They have, a, they have a lot of currency to go out there and do a lot of M&A if they want to do it. And, and given the market caps and given how well large cap tech has performed, there really hasn't been a, a whole lot of M&A. Uh, and, and what's really interesting is if you look at all these companies, what, what do they have in, in common? They, they really don't have any growth. They're, they're very lucky. They're basically lucky if they're growing uh, one to two times global GDP. Um, so I, I think we're going to see M&A uh, ramp up more and here's the other thing. Everybody always wants to say or say that, well, hey, these, these guys, all, they all wait for companies to be in the, in, you know, in the trough to buy. Uh, you know, they want to buy cheap. Well, if, if you look through the history of, of mergers and acquisition activity, it's actually just the opposite. You get, you get far, far more M&A activity when stock prices are going up, not down, because nobody wants to buy at the bottom. And I always jokingly say, but it's true, uh, the the large companies and the buyers of the biggest M and A deals, they're sometimes the worst momentum investors of anybody. So they feel way better about buying stocks and doing M and A um, when when the prices of what they're thinking about buying is going up. Um, and, and as l the last thing I'll sort of say on on what's been bought or or who's consolidated, there's really only been one area of technology where there's been a major consolidation. And that's the semiconductor group. Uh, most of the other areas of tech, there there's a huge need. There's almost too many companies doing uh, the same thing. And, and lastly, and the point is there, um, small and mid-cap stocks are basically as cheap as they were uh, on relative valuation metrics since that 2012 time frame. And again, that's another parallel or another echo of, of 2013. Okay, so let's let's move on. Let's go to the next slide, please. I think we're going to get into. I think it's going to be security. Here we go. So, so now th this this could be um, if there's an area that I'm surprised that we've seen little to no merger activity is this area, because if if I were to look at Microsoft as one great case in point, given all the contacts they have, all the relationships, all the customers, and how deeply in embedded they are with their clients already. An area that they could make major, major uh, inroads if they were to buy one or two uh, companies of security. And there's uh, there's a ton of beaten up security companies. We just saw FireEye report. They had a pretty bad report. But you know, this is a company that I do think eventually gets bought either for two to three times its current price, maybe even a little higher than that. 
Uh, they probably figure it out. They probably do a little better. But you get a company basically selling at two to two and a half times forward sales um, in an area where M&A deals that tend to go off go off anywhere from seven and a half to ten times sales. So I'm not saying they're going to get seven and a half. They, they certainly aren't going to get seven and a half to ten times sales if they aren't growing at, at a good rate. But I don't think they're. I don't think a deal is going to be much less than four and a half, five or six times sales. And that's just one good example. Another great example is Imperva. They, I'm not exactly sure. I don't think anybody anybody knows that they a deal was in the works. They were sort of either officially up for sale or officially evaluating offers that had been extended to them, but no deal happened. That that's another name though. I think could easily get bought out. Uh, probably my favorite, uh, my favorite fundamental play in the cybersecurity sp space, CyberArk. That's ticker CYBR. Uh, they have some of the best growth in the industry. And again, we're we're talking about a company that has a relatively small market cap. They do they do pretty critical stuff in the security infrastructure space. Uh, only has a market cap right now about 1.8 billion. Um, again, it would it would be nothing for somebody basically pay 100% premium and buy what I think is one of the best one of the best companies in the space. And again, you're getting a company with a lot of growth and a very important footprint uh, for you know for under four billion bucks. Uh, Fortinet just had a good quarter. Um, that's been a kind of a perennial buyout target off and on. But again, if you just look at uh, sort of sort of the potential buyers here. There's, there's, and I just have a small list, you know, Microsoft, Symantec, Checkpoint, Intel, Cisco, Juniper. In fact, Juniper's made a lot of mistakes. They probably should have bought into the cybersecurity space more aggressively than they have. They've tried a couple small deals, um, but, uh, you know, they let some people go, and a company, that, a few people that used to work for them are now at a company called Palo Alto Networks, which has been one of the darlings of the cybersecurity space. So the bottom line is there's basically no growth in mega cap tech. There's a ton of really target-rich or a lot of companies with pretty good growth in the cybersecurity area. And interestingly, there just hasn't been much deal flow there. All right, uh, next slide, please. But the bottom line is I think that that area – and by the way, the last thought on that, it, all it would take really to ignite multiple deals would be one deal in that space. And that's, that's what we've seen a lot of times before – that's what happened in the semiconductor industry. One or two deals went off, and another four or five followed. Uh, I think the same thing would happen in cybersecurity. Um, so, you know, the the other thing I think right now, what, what a lot of times when you don't have that, you either have a market that's sort of all up or all down. I think right now we may move into a mar market where we we have the market broaden broaden out. Uh, as I talked about, it's been very thin. Uh, the market leadership's been very it's, – it's sort of been FANG plus two names at any given point in time. Um, but, but we haven't really had a market where you could run shorts and also run longs at the same time. Uh, in fact, the last year I could say that strategy worked really well was probably 2014. Um, so, so the way the market's been moving the last two years, it's sort of an all up or all down, and really the all up is still only eight or nine names. And then when everything goes down, everything goes down together, and the correlation's one. Um, I think we we could move into an environment. I do want to see the FANG stocks roll over a little bit and show a little bit of chart weakness. But I basically think uh, pretty much all of the whole FANG contingent is shortable at some point here fairly soon. I think that the stocks are just too high. The, 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 one of my favorite expressions is, hey, this is going to be the first trillion dollar company. Uh, this is going to be the company that, you know, uh, it, nobody's going to be able to compete with. I'm talking about Amazon right now, obviously. But but the same kind of talk you hear about Amazon today, um, we heard in spades in 2012. Uh, you know, uh, Apple's going to be the largest market cap of all time. You're stupid to sell it. It's going to be a trillion-dollar market cap, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and Apple's a great company and might eventually get there. But when people were saying in 2012, uh, the stock had a 40% correction in front of it. Um, and I'm not so sure Amazon is going to end up being sort of the largest company um, in, in tech anyway. I don't know. I, I think there's a number of things that can hurt that company. Um, the other area, they, one, one area where there, where there was somewhat broad participation in a, a number of companies, one, was the fiber optic space last year. So we're talking about Acacia, which is a really hot IPO, which has now gone down, you know, 50%. Uh, that was one of my favorite shorts when that stock was 115 plus. Well, now at half the price, I'm not short it, and I don't think it's a short. I think it's a long. 
Um, but Finisar had a good year. Sienna had a good year. Uh, uh, Light Lumentum with ticker symbol LITE, uh, that had a good year, had a pretty good report. Stocks up three or four points today. I think any pullback in this space is probably a, a pretty good, uh, a pretty good, a pretty good idea because um, this this is another area where there actually has been some consolidation. I think the opportunity for growth uh, is, is pretty good. And that whole fiber optic move of 2016 was largely driven by a, a big investment cycle in China. Um, we have not really seen a major investment cycle in North America, nor have we seen a major investment cycle. Uh, in the big telcos and the big cable companies doing major fiber optic upgrades. Um, that just hasn't really happened for a number of years. So you have a potential uh, kind of uh, at least two legs of, of the stool. Let's call, say, China's the third, but you have Europe and North America could really kick in for these for, for these companies. So, so let's talk about NVIDIA. Now, NVIDIA is another one of my favorite shorts. I mean, everybody loves this name. Uh, everybody basically says, hey, it's, it's, it's the chip stock you have to own. I, I think it's exactly what you want to sell right now. And the main reason is exactly why I was saying to buy Micron, I don't know, a year ago at 10 bucks. It's, you know, I think the best way to say it is NVIDIA is still a chip company. And I think people have kind of forgotten it's a chip company. The one thing chip companies always are and always will be is they're cyclical. Uh, they can have cellular growth, um, but they're basically cyclical companies. And ba when they look the best, and they look the cheapest many times is the time that they're the most expensive. And likewise, when they're when earnings when earnings basically crash and collapse or go to negative, a lot of times that's the best time to buy cyclical. Likewise, it's the best time to buy semiconductor. But um, you know we've seen this before. Uh, Amba was a darling chip company many uh, probably two years ago. Uh, went haywire to the upside. You know it hasn't done a whole lot for the last two or three years. Um, so, you know, chip companies tend to stay chip companies. They don't turn into software companies. And I think people have kind of forgotten that NVIDIA uh, is still a chip company. Um, and therefore, when the cycle changes or cools off, earnings growth is going to decelerate and they're going to have the same, same sort of cyclical effect. And you'll probably see the stock go down a ton. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see somewhere between a 30 and 40 percent sell off in NVIDIA. Uh, whenever the first quarter just isn't as great anymore. Um, so let's hit the charts, uh, and we'll go through these relatively quickly so we can leave time for Q&A um, at the end. Um, so so the, the first three charts I'm going to show you guys are, are sort of there more for illustration. So guess what? Just talking about NVIDIA, here's Micron. Um, you all remember probably that, that Micron was universally hated for um, at least half a year, if not a year. Uh, you know, the, the, but the cycle was fairly easy to call. Um, the, you know, now everything's going well uh, for Micron. By the way, I think Micron could go a lot higher. I mean, this stock has doubled. I normally don't like a stock once it's gone up 2.5x off of lows. But in this case, you know, I've been saying this since the NVIDIA was 10. I've been saying it could be a, I'm sorry, in Micron, I've been saying that this stock could be a 30 to a $40 stock again. That's kind of where my long-term target is. So this is one that's gone up a lot. I still think it could go up. Um, you know, there, there's actually a good question here. Some, somebody's commenting on the, the memory cycle, uh, and he, he may even remember some things I, I was I was uttering a while ago. But but yeah, I, I think I think Micron is probably in any three or four of the cycle. I think the iPhone eight and sort of that whole cycle for smartphones um is, is is really good. I think there we haven't really seen um, the cycle for uh, large data centers. Uh, I think that cycle is still in front of them. Micron still has a technology it's called 3D tech, uh, which we haven't even really seen yet. I think it's going to start in trials in another quarter or two. But this is a stock that can go quite a bit higher. Go, let's go to the next slide. But it's kind of here for illustration of if you look at a chip stock, it goes from hated to loved to hated to loved and so on and so forth. I would not be surprised to see NVIDIA act like that at some point in the future. Uh, next slide, please. So while we wait for that, another another uh, couple companies that look just like this um, uh, would be a Western Digital, which should be coming up here pretty quick. Um, and we're going to look at Arista Networks, which is going to come up pretty quick. Um, I'm not sure all you can see. I'm not seeing my uh, I'm not seeing my slides move forward. Um, but uh, oh, here we go. So here's Western Digital, another stock that was just absolutely hated. 
Um, same thing, cyclical tech stock. Uh, again, they have they have some 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 areas of secular gro- secular growth, but generally Western Digital is a cyclical company. Acts that way. You can see from the chart, gets very cheap. Well, actually, at the bottom of the chart, it's probably really expensive because earnings are really low. Um, and and then let's go ahead and go to the next chart too, uh, because really Micron and Western Digital were there for uh, some illustrative purposes. Um, but as you can see, what happens to these, these cyclical companies is uh, they're, they're universally hated when they're cheap. Um, so here's one. Here's one of the few stocks that did not participate in the fiber optic move last year uh, was Infinera. Now, Infinera has its own issues. By the way, these are all – most of these will be weekly charts. If it's, a, if it's a daily chart, I will call it out. Um, but Infinera basically, basically missed the move. Um, why they missed the move? They kind of missed their own reinvestment and sales cycle, uh, but they're coming into a good cycle now. Uh, same kind of deal. Stock was pretty popular. Everybody liked it at highs. Been beaten up. Been more than cut in half. I think this is a stock could have a very good year. Um, but you can just see this is a great illustration. And I do a lot of long-term cycle research too about when you get anywhere from four or five or six quarters of earnings deceleration, revenue deceleration, and you start seeing an inflection, you start seeing numbers improving, but people don't want to believe in the improvement yet, or people don't want to believe, they just kind of, the hatred is pervasive, the hatred persists on a company, it takes a while to get going. Um, But I think Infinera is kind of a classic, has that classic cyclical look, it's going to turn it's actually above the 20 EMA on the weekly, which is sometimes not easy to do for a chart that's turning. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. Um, but I think that's a, that's a great kind of case of, of a stock that uh, was kind of a mini darling, which could uh, which could become uh, uh, a nice name again. Now this this is a name I've basically liked Splunk ever since the IPO. Um, by and large, it's been a good performer. The one thing I'll say about Splunk, Splunk literally has never missed an earnings report. So they've beat, uh, they may not have beat and raised every quarter, but they've at least been a beat and in line report every quarter. Now, I, I drew a trend line here because this is really interesting. We'll see this a couple more times. Um, so so l- l- look at what's happened to Splunk. It basically rode up hot stock, was a, was a really high growth company. Uh, interesting thing, the last two years, their, their growth rate has not decelerated. So everybody thought their growth rate was going to decelerate. They're still producing 40, 45% growth. And so just think about that. So if a company's produced, let's just call it 50% growth for two years in a row, guess what? Company's doubled. Well, has Splunk stock price doubled in the last two years? Not at all. It's been consolidating for roughly two years off of that spike high. Um, and this is a pretty interesting trend line formation right here. But uh, by the way, the big blip, the big uh, low in Splunk in early 16 actually had nothing to do with Splunk. That was the data missed a quarter and missed very badly. Um, that's Tableau Software. Their stock went from, I think, 90 to 40 in a day. Um, that took Splunk with it. That was also kind of a crash fest time for the U.S. stock market. Um, but there you go. So Splunk kind of healed up from that point. Again, they the, the big spike you see, the, the big rise of recovering the shares happened because roughly a week or two later, they had a, 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 their usual really good earnings report. But this is a name I think could go a lot higher. I think they've consolidated for a couple of years. Um, I, I think it'll retake all-time highs and then some in the future. Uh, the valuation of this, stuff in this company has been cut in half over the last two years as well because they basically doubled in size and the stock hasn't gone anywhere. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so here's – I already mentioned CyberArk. If you look at CyberArk, though, it's basically the same pattern. Um, they have roughly similar growth. Uh, They've been producing very good growth. I'm not sure if their growth has been – some quarters have been higher, some quarters have been lower than Splunk. But but let's just call it a 35 to 50% plus grower. Their earnings growth has been way, way in excess of that. But here again, you've got a company that really hasn't gone anywhere for two years. In fact, stock's lower today than it was two years ago. Uh, Companies uh, doubled in size or more. Uh, if I were to draw a trend line, uh, trend line looks very similar to that too. So again, what all we need for companies like this to really start working is a market to broaden out. Um, I have another expression I like to use. I call them, them anointed stocks. So the FANG trade is anointed, has been anointed. Apple was anointed in 2012. 
I actually think one or both of these last two companies could become uh, anointed names um, because they're large enough market caps that people could sink their teeth into them. Uh, the big institutions could buy them, uh, and they've been producing the strong, per pervasive growth. So anyway, next slide, please. But I think I think CyberArk's a winner, and really the stock. Uh, the stock performance has not meshed or matched uh, its, its underlying fundamental performance, and that's what I look for all the time. So th this is really just another illustrative chart of Amazon. I think uh, it's easy to like Amazon. It's easy to like winners and want to be in winners, and you feel kind of left out if you're not in them. But I just think, you know, sometimes you just got to pull up a weekly or monthly chart, and it's this simple. Uh, in early 2012, this was the less than a $200 stock. Um, in late 14, this was less than a $300 stock. And today, Amazon's roughly 830, 840. Um, well, let's call it 800 to 840. So, I don't know. The company is relatively the same company it was back then. They have Amazon Web Services today. Uh, that was a, more of a new product two or three years ago. But, you know, I don't know. I, I, I honestly have no, uh, I really have no idea why, why anybody would buy Amazon up here. Um, if it were to pull back, uh, you know, to 600 or less, I, I might get interested on, on the long side. But as I said before, I think the whole FANG contingent is basically set up as a short. Uh, I, You know, last I checked, trees don't grow the sky. Uh, relative valuation does tend to come back in the favor from time to time. Um, so next chart, please. I believe this one's going to be Facebook. Uh, yeah, look, now, now here, there is a big difference between Amazon and Facebook. And Facebook... Uh, I was one of the few people on the planet that liked the stock when it was a $20 stock. Uh, and, and I could probably find article evidence to prove, to prove that statement quite easily, by the way. Um, but this is, a, this is a company I really used to like. Um, and I, I still think the company has a lot of merit. But, uh, you know, again, just gone up a lot. Uh, I do think they could have some, some growth acceleration. The company itself has essentially been guiding to growth deceleration the last couple quarters. Um, they have yet to really show much of it yet. But anyway, the, the, here's the main difference, though. This is a much calmer uptrend. So the, the one thing, I would not call this a bubble chart. Uh, Amazon looks more like a bubble chart, more parabolic to me. Uh, Facebook has been a relatively mild uptrend, so that could say it could go up a little bit. Hey, Mike, are you trying to ask me something? Um, if somebody's trying to ask me something, just just uh, just let me know. Um, uh, I do see a question here on on Tesla. Uh, I do have an opinion on Tesla. It's really kind of a mixed opinion. Um, Tesla is a funny company. I think I think I can really make a bull case and a bear case for Tesla uh, on pure fundamentals, pure numbers, pure math. It's kind of a, there's a bear case. However. If Tesla becomes the leading battery, innovative battery uh, designer and maker and producer in the world, then Tesla might go ob obscenely higher. So, so my view of Tesla is it's, it's, it, if, if it kind of just remains an auto company, it's very, very overvalued. But if they hit a home run on the battery technology and the innovation of batteries and they could lower the weight, lower the cost, increase the, the storage efficiency of batteries, then you, you really do have to look uh, at the company differently. Um, anyway, next slide, because, again, I think Facebook is more illustrative there. Uh, again, I don't, I don't know why I would buy the stock here. Okay, now here, <laughs> uh, it's just hard for me not to laugh. Okay, so, so I'm not laughing at people that own NVIDIA. And, again, there's another stock I like. I, I'm kind of stupid. I, I've had NVIDIA a few times. That, you know, uh, I, I've made some good returns on it, but I, I didn't hold it into this huge run of 2016. But, anyway, I laugh because – it's just really, if you just pull up a weekly or monthly chart, the odds are it's just a bad buy. Even if the company is great, even if the company is tremendous, even if they don't have a growth deceleration, which I think they're going to, because they are still a chip company and they're not a software company. Um, anyway, bottom line is now this is a parabolic chart. This looks a lot like Amber looked like uh, 115, 120, 125. There you go. Don't really need to say a whole lot, but um, uh, I think that thing's a short. Anyway, next slide. Uh, I'm going to get to a quick question here, too. So somebody, they're asking about PI, P -I, which is a company called Impinge. You know, there's been some really good commentary. I'll, I'll do a shameless plug for briefing. There's been some really good commentary on briefing on Impinge, P-I, ticker symbol P-I. 
I honestly, I don't, you know, I follow, I don't know, at least three, 400 companies pretty closely. It's just not a name I follow very closely. So I tend to comment on names that I feel I kind of know as well as about anybody. Um, that's not a name I've really dug into and done a lot of work on. So don't have a lot of comments, but there is a fair amount of commentary of that name on the briefing site. Okay, Qualcomm. Okay. Now, is this the antithesis of NVIDIA? Eh, not necessarily because Qualcomm has had some issues. But again, just a, just a way better buy. Qualcomm trades at about four times net cash. Um, Qualcomm also has a very, very dominant position in certain things that they do. One would be intellectual property um, with, with some key technology patents. Um, the stock has had this huge drop on Apple suing them. Well, if anybody that knows much about Qualcomm knows that, pretty much from the inception of the company, they have been fighting lawsuits and winning lawsuits. So the bottom line is, uh, my, my, most of the time I'm gonna take Apple in a lawsuit against somebody. Uh, if Apple's suing Qualcomm, I'm actually gonna take Qualcomm. So I'm not too worried about litigation risk with Qualcomm, but it, it's just a really good buy. Trades at four times net cash. Also, I think people are very, very much underestimating the potential, if they get this NXPI merger done, this is going to be exactly the kind of chip company that is this massive cash flow generator that everybody loves. And what made Skyworks go? Cash flow generation. What made, um, uh, tip of my tongue, what made Avago, which is now combined with Broadcom, what made that stock a superstar? Uh, M&A activity and cash flow generation. So, you know, I've been harping on Qualcomm for years. That they need to do more M&A. Hey, they pulled the trigger. If they get the deal done, I think it could be a huge deal, and I think the, the stock works really, really well. Um, plus, you know, it's not an overheated chart, and if the market broadens out, it's got to find names that are worthy of buying, and, and that's, that's a great, great name. Uh, I love this company long term. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, Sign is another one. Uh, now, Synaptics is a little more controversial. They used to be years ago. They got they got a ton a ton of business from from Apple. They were sort of the key innovator of the technology of the the, the flywheel on iPods. Um, they broadened out. They do a lot more. They have a lot more broader technology portfolio now. They have a really really diversified customer base. Again, this now this is a daily chart. Uh, they don't they wouldn't look this beaten up on a weekly chart because this been has been a long term winner. Um, but but there are still a few. My my main point to put. Synaptics on here, Sina, is really about um, is is really about the fact that there could be a lot of M and A. There there still could be a fair amount of M and A in the semiconductor space. If I had to list three names that I think are high probability takeout candidates, Synaptics would be one of those three companies for sure. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, I got a question here. Uh, while we go to the next, slide, I got a question on Twilio. Uh, yeah, I I actually think Twilio had had very a very good report. Uh, you know, the stock, in my view, the stock has been beaten up for two reasons. It's kind of like the Acacia effect where it was a very hot IPO. It went up tremendously, probably went up too quickly, too fast, um, but it has been consolidating. Again, it's been cut in half or more off the highs. Um, but really the single, if there's been one single factor that just hammered Twilio, has been kind of trading desk selling and, and algorithmic uh, selling pressure based on lockup expiries. Well, you know, one thing I think, yeah, a lot, what a lockup expiry does, it puts a lot more shares uh, out, out in the float, but it doesn't change the value of the company. It doesn't, it doesn't change the fundamentals of the company. But I think, I think that the, the quote unquote, the bears have been able to beat Twilio up a lot, kind of over these, oh, you don't want to, you don't want to own the stock in front of a lockup. And so they still, they get people to sell the stock in front of a lockup. And then what does the stock do? They have a lockup and it goes up or it doesn't go down. Or the people that could sell shares aren't really selling that much of it. So, and I've seen that effect before. Um, there's a question on Micron. I would I, I addressed Micron pretty well earlier in the presentation, so I might um, I might just urge somebody to go back and look at uh, look at the commentary. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, let, let's talk about Cray. So, so what has been the, the, whenever a stock goes parabolic like Nvidia, there's always a thesis, there's always a reason, there's always a narrative, right? What's been the narrative that has driven NVIDIA to kind of crazy heights? It's been artificial intelligence and big data. Well, guess what? 
um, if, if, you, if you kind of look at and you know how artificial intelligence works, and, you know, yeah, NVIDIA chips do drive it. Supercomputing tends to drive it. Uh, what really drives it, though, is things like Splunk and Veronis and New Relic and big data software applications. However, it, to the degree um, that supercomputing comes into play uh, and to the degree that there's a Trump stock that is, could possibly be security play, supercomputing, artificial intelligence, the whole ball of wax, I, I'd point to Cray. Um, Cray had a really good cycle a few years ago. Uh, very good company. Uh, one of the leaders in global supercomputing technology. Um, but, you know, they basically the stock, uh, you know, what, Cray has these, these, these long tail cycles and they do large percentages of revenues. And, and it, the, basically the, the best way to say it is, is they're real lumpy. So they can have a really good year, but in, in a good year, maybe they have a couple quarters that aren't so great. But I think this is just a great example of a company. If, if, if AI is that really big of a deal, um, and supercomputing really comes to the fore again, and, and the U.S. government invests a ton of money in cybersecurity and supercomputing, this, this, this is a company that could really, really do well. Uh, next chart, please. Um, I think we're going to get to PayPal. So there's a question on PayPal. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to get to it here fairly soon. Uh, you can go ahead and skip this one. Um, there you go. Uh, this chart is here pretty much for illustration. This is just Finisar. Um, as you can see, Finisar's fiber optic company, uh, pretty volatile stock on a weekly chart, tends not to look that volatile sometimes on a daily chart. Um, but sometimes I'm accused of only liking chart bottom, bottom charts or, or companies that are at 52-week lows or multi-year lows. Hey, I still like Micron. That's a, no close to a 52-week high. I still like, uh, <clears throat> I still like Finisar plenty. Uh, that just came off a 52-week high. Finisar, I think, could at least get to 4550 uh, $4550, bucks, I have to see another quarter or two and see if they can keep their momentum going. But I do like this company long term. Um, again, PayPal, I'm pretty sure PayPal is going to be a chart that we're going to get to. Um, uh, next, next chart, please. Some good questions on the, on the post, by the way. Um, Acacia, okay, now here, here is, uh, here's what happens to an IPO when people get way too enthused about it. It's really that simple. Uh, Acacia, for its part, by the way, they, have not, they, haven't, they haven't missed a quarter. Uh, they haven't missed a guide. Uh, they've guided up uh, probably three or four times, in fact. Um, but, you know, here again, this is a stock I did not like at all at 100, 105, 120. Well, it's been cut in half. I like it a lot better now. Um, I do think uh, I think their full year is going to be better. The only issue we might have with Acacia, this, they, they talked about seasonality in China. They already kind of talked about that on the last earnings call. So there are are some concerns that the upcoming quarter uh, might not be great. I do I think they're going to have a very good full year, uh, and I do think what will happen with Acacia, they will diversify away from their very heavy China exposure. And they'll start landing uh, some North America contracts. My guess is once they get two to three North America contracts, uh, this could really get that stock going again. Um, okay, so got a, got a real question. Oracle is a company I kind of mentioned early, earlier, a large cap company. I think Oracle's just got to keep doing M&A because they're basically a slow growth to a no growth uh, mega cap company. Um, I think Oracle could be a company that ends up buying a lot of companies that I talk about and look at all the time. Um, next chart, please. Okay, Google. Uh, Google here is a pretty much here for illustration purposes, but but this is going to be a point counterpoint. Okay, so here's Google. Again, was my largest position several years ago. Uh, I was a seller of Apple and a buyer of Google in 2012. That worked out very very well. Um, actually, don't have any Google right now. Google is a somewhat tougher stock to short. Again, I would I would not call this chart parabolic. I would say Google has largely earned. Uh, uh, both from a growth standpoint uh, and revenue and earnings, they've largely earned a lot of the appreciation. But again, um, I just don't see a lot, really a very compelling reason to buy Google up here. I think there's a lot better names. So let's go to the next chart, um, and we'll get to a name I think that is a much better buy uh, than Google. And here it is, PayPal. So, so as you can see, PayPal's done very, very little um, since the IPO. 
Um, they got spun out of eBay, which everybody probably knows. Uh, but this, this company sells at a much, much cheaper valuation than a lot of these other tech companies that are very favored. I think they have a huge runway. And here's the other thing. What is PayPal? PayPal is a technology company, but PayPal is essentially a large financial too. So what's been very, very curious to me is you've seen the financial stocks go absolutely haywire to the upside post-Trump. Now, PayPal, as you can see, has not gone to the upside. Uh, I think PayPal, it basically, put it this way, to the degree that Goldman and, and, and um, uh, Capital One Financial and Citibank and all these other companies, guess what? PayPal's in credit cards. They do payment processing. Uh, Visa and MasterCard do payment processing. Um, the bottom line is sort of every peer that you compare with, if you want to say PayPal's in three businesses, then you can basically say every single peer of PayPal's in their three businesses has gone haywire to the upside and PayPal hasn't moved. This is a stock I think easily, easily goes to 50, 55, maybe even $60. And is, by the way, at 60, it would still be relatively cheap. It would not be that expensive of a company at $60. Okay, no, so, but, but I just think it's just a tremendously better buy than any of the FANG stocks right here, right now. Um, next, next chart, and this, that might be the last one. Next slide, please. I'll get a question here on Nimble while we're waiting. Oh, there is one more. Got a question on Nimble. Uh, n again, Nimble is one of these really, really beaten up, kind of forgotten companies. Hasn't done that poorly. They, they, I think they had a two to a three quarter period where earnings weren't very good, but they've kind of recovered. Last two quarters have been quite a bit better. Uh, there's a lot of competition in that space, but again, N Nimble's like one of these companies, very low market cap. Uh, I, I would not be surprised at all to see Nimble taken out for a pretty substantial premium over the, over the current stock price. Um, you know, 50, 80, 100% premium for M&A target uh, wouldn't surprise me. N N uh, Nimble might just end up working on their own, too. They, they might go into a, a two- or three-quarter period where growth reaccelerates and the stock ends up doing better. Okay, I think this is the last chart. I'm going to finish on an oil. So we've been talking tech for 40 minutes. Um, here, here's an example of a company I think is pretty compelling, uh, just, just from a pure valuation standpoint. I also do really like that weekly chart. You see what, what it's done, uh, went to a crash low off of a, a really kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe it was a semi bubblish high. Uh, you got a crash low. It's been, it's been a year plus kind of working itself moderately higher. It's back in the weekly cloud. I think above through the weekly cloud, uh, I think could act a lot better. Uh, interestingly, another company that was on death's door was a company called Clayton Williams, CWEI. Uh, Clayton Williams just ended up getting bought out for something like $148. Uh, at one point, it was a 4 or $5 or $6 stock, too. So, uh, and, and guess what? Whiting Petroleum has Permian Basin assets just like Clayton Williams had, which is the main reason that the company got bought out. Um, so anyway, that's about it. Uh, what's the next slide? Go to the next one. I think that is the last chart, though. Yeah, I had a couple okay, uh, questions. So, I don't know if you saw them come through, Sean. Yeah. yeah if, Did if you see uh, anything, somebody was asking? Uh, uh, I... Yeah. Yeah. What What is uh, pin action? Somebody wanted to know. What is pin action? You oh, mentioned. Oh, well, pin. Uh, Pin action is, is as simple as let's say uh, let's say FireEye would have had a good quarter instead of a bad quarter and the stock would have been up 20 bucks or I mean 20 percent. Um, pin action would be if CyberArk and Palo Alto and other cybersecurity companies go up in tandem with it. Or likewise, hey, pin action could be a, a stock in a particular group has a bad report or a stock in a particular group gets bought out. Okay, so let's talk, here's, a, here's the perfect uh, example of pin action. I think Whiting Petroleum should have got pin action off of Clayton Williams getting bought out. It did not. Uh, so it's sort of amazing that Whiting, in fact, has gone down since Clayton Williams got bought out, and they do have some pretty similar assets, and it would not make much, be a big surprise to see a takeout interest in Whiting Petroleum. But Whiting Petroleum has, has shown zero pin action, and the market's had uh, largely zero pin action. Uh, the market of 2013 had tremendous pin action, and most most normal markets do, by the way. So, what was a um, what was another question? Yeah, and there was one or other one know? about you had mentioned TAM. You had mentioned TAM a little bit before with uh, you know some stocks, including Twitter. If you could just elaborate a little bit more on what TAM is. 
Yeah, by the way, I thought I had a Twitter chart in there. I did not see a Twitter chart. I thought I had a Twitter chart. Twi- the Twitter weekly chart, by the way, looks a lot. Now, it's a steeper downtrend line, but it's a, it's a, it's a very, very similar downtrend line to what I pointed out with um, a, a couple of those other companies, uh, Splunk. So TAM is total addressable market. So a company like Splunk, for example, has a massive TAM. Um, when, when people were all gaga over data, which is Tableau software at 115, 120, 130, uh, one, of, one of my primary concerns with data is that data did not have the TAM, did not have the near the size of the total addressable market as Splunk. And yet it was being treated uh, like, like a company that had a far larger TAM than it did. So the TAM, total addressable market is in effect, what's the total population of sort of companies they could sell to? Or what's the what's the total size of, of that product or that, that company and how much, how much of the market can they penetrate? Um, bottom line, Tableau software does not have the TAM that Splunk does. And sort of the fact that the stock, the stock price got way over enthused, uh, they missed a couple quarters, that TAM uh, or lack thereof came back to bite them pretty hard. Um, but yeah, I always look at uh, TAM. I mean, put it this way. If, if, there, if, if there is one major overriding bull case for Amazon long-term, it's the TAM. And what Amazon's been, been very good about doing is creating more TAMs, more markets for themselves to go after. And they tend to only go after markets that do have massive total addressable markets. So, uh, long, you know, if, if, to the degree that Amazon has this massive bull case, it's because they go after markets that have huge total addressable markets. Okay, I think that's uh Is there anything I mean, else? any questions that Sean didn't get to? No, any any questions? There's a few more that Sean didn't get to. Um, you know, he'll, he'll email response or we'll post live on the site and get and get to the rest of them. Um, yeah, so just want to wrap up I guess with your uh, the last slide here, Sean. Can you see that one market well, yeah, I mean, uh, key for uh, investing gains? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think, uh, you know, the one thing that we have not seen, uh, 2013 we had, we had a little bit, um, but, but good bull markets, and again, last year was 2013 where we had a rising overall market and you, you had a VIX that wasn't at rock bottom the whole time. And so in certain cases, you had a rising market with a rising VIX. Um, so the bottom line is, uh, in, in the last two years, what have we seen? Every time we get a little fear in the VIX, a little spike in the VIX, you tend to have a market sell-off. Well, again, that's not necessarily normal. Uh, there's been plenty of markets through history where you can enter a period of rising volatility, but with rising stock prices. Basically, you, what happens is you get stocks, this, the range of the, of the price of stocks expand to the upside, which that's volatile. So you have increasing volatility with increasing stock prices and more upside volatility we haven't seen that for a long time. I think that could happen. And then the, you know, phrase I always like to have, you know, everybody always worries about catching a perfect entry or catching a perfect price. Um, you know, it's not about catching the bottom tick or the perfect price or one perfect entry in a stock. In fact, I like to scale in multiple times, but what really makes you money is a trade that sticks and wins for you. Uh, it's not the perfect entry. It's not the perfect price, but it's a price that works for you. Um, or, or it's a series of prices or an accumulated position that works for you uh, that you can make really good gains on. Um, so, yeah, that's just uh, – I think people kind of forget about that. Uh, this is not a game of perfection. If you're always – if you're striving, striving for perfect entries and exits, you're, you're, you're pretty much never going never gonna to see them. Okay, I think we'll wrap it with that. Thanks, Sean, and uh, thank everyone for attending the webinar. We'll actually have oh, another yeah, one pretty, next week. Oh, yeah, a lot of people – yeah, a lot of people. Yep. So I'll have another one next week, but uh, put up a chart, Brett Manning. And uh, okay, thanks again, everyone. Thanks, John. Take care, guys. Thanks. Yep. Bye.